This is the Music History Today in-depth podcast for August 7th through the 13th. On this week's show, we celebrate the birthdays of the Rickenbacker frying pan and the merry-go-round. We also celebrate the mainstream finding gangster rap and the passing of two iconic entertainers. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. Let's start with two passings. These two icons of the 20th century passed away on August 8th, five years apart from each other. First, Glenn Campbell was born on April 22, 1936 in Billingston, Arkansas. He got a guitar at the age of four as a gift from his uncle, who was in a band and who taught him how to play. The family money issues were such that he had to get jobs at an early age in order to help his family make ends meet. At the age of 17, he decided that a normal job wasn't for him, so he joined his uncle's band. and Then he formed his own band called the Western Wranglers. In 1960, the siren call of Hollywood, California came calling to him and he moved there to become a session musician. He also worked at a publishing house writing songs for other people. His session musician gigs picked up pretty quickly as word got around about just how good a guitar player he really was. And soon he was appearing on records by the Beach Boys, Dean Martin, Nat King Cole, Merle Haggard, and Frank Sinatra. He met Elvis Presley while working on Viva Las Vegas, and the two of them became very good friends. He was also one of the guitarists on the Beach Boys' legendary album, Pet Sounds. Glenn got a solo recording contract in 1961 and released his first album, which did okay. The next year, he released an album with Capitol Records. Over the next few years, he would release a few more albums that did, well, let's say, poor to moderately. Glenn then started working on the television shows Star Root, Shindig, and Hollywood Jamboree. When Glenn's string of low-selling albums and singles continued, Capitol Records considered dropping him but decided to give him one more chance. In 1966, producer Al DeLore proved to be the missing piece to Glenn's puzzle. He had a hit with a cover of Buffy St. Marie's song, Universal Soldier, and then Glenn had hits like Gentle on My Mind, By the Time I Get to Phoenix, I Want to Live, and Wichita Lineman. He also ended up with four Grammy Awards for his efforts. His song from the John Wayne movie, True Grit, got him two Academy Award nominations. From the late 1960s to the 1970s, Glenn was everywhere. He had a TV variety show, he had hits like Rhinestone Cowboy and Southern Nights, and he did television appearances and acting gigs. He also had a celebrity marriage to country music singer Tanya Tucker, which ended with accusations of domestic violence and substance abuse. In 2010, Glenn Campbell found out that he was in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's disease. It was announced in 2011. Glenn embarked on what would be his final tour and also recording sessions. The material from these sessions wouldn't be released until 2017 as the album Adios. One of his final performances was at the Grammy Awards. That was the show where Kim Kardashian took a lot of heat for seemingly not caring about one of Glenn's final performances as she was looking at her cell phone as the audience was giving him a standing ovation. Serious lack of respect. The album Adios was released on June 9, 2017. On August 8, 2017, Glenn Campbell passed away from the effects of Alzheimer's. Tributes poured in from across the music community. The biggest tributes came from great guitar players who consider Glenn to be one of the greatest guitarists of all time. The death of entertainer Glenn Campbell from Alzheimer's disease on August 8, 2017. 
Five years after Glenn Campbell in 2022, this legend passed away. Olivia Newton-John was born in England on September 26, 1948, but moved to Australia when she was young. Her lineage is rather impressive. One of her grandfathers fled Hitler's Germany and won the Nobel Prize in physics. Her great-grandfather and great-great-grandfathers were both judges. Her father worked for England's MI5 and was one of the people who apprehended Nazi Rudolf Hess. Olivia's career started when she was 14 years old when she was in a girl group. It didn't last too long, but it did get her spots on television shows and connections, including meeting future friend and collaborator Pat Carroll. During one of those shows, Olivia won a trip to England to record. She didn't want to go because she had a boyfriend in Australia, but was eventually talked into going by her mother. Once she was in England, she didn't want to stay. She was lonely. She missed her boyfriend and tried to come back to Australia a few times, but her mother thwarted those plans, determined that her daughter try and see things through, and probably also to keep her away from the boyfriend. You know how moms can get sometimes. It helped for a while that Pat Carroll moved to England on a work visa. Olivia worked with famed producer Don Kirshner for a time in a group called Tomorrow, but that group didn't gain much traction at all. In 1971, Olivia recorded her debut album, If Not For You. The title track was a big hit for her internationally. While other songs on that album became big hits overseas, they weren't big in America. She broke through again in America, though, in 1973 with the song Let Me Be There, which went top five on three different Billboard charts, including the country music chart. She was also nominated for and won the Grammy Award for Best Country Music Single by a female for that particular song. Olivia ended up representing England in the Eurovision Song Contest, but lost that year to ABBA's Waterloo. She did end up getting an album deal with EMI Records from it, which proved fortuitous. The album If You Love Me, Let Me Know had the title track go top five on the Hot 100 singles chart and on the country chart. The next song, I Honestly Love You, also became a huge hit and won her two Grammy Awards, including Record of the Year. At this point, Olivia started to receive some backlash from the country music community who didn't like the fact that someone who wasn't from America was finding success in their genre and winning their major awards on top of it all. It got to the point where other artists like Dolly Parton's sister had to defend her. It also led to her moving to America in order to record her next album, Have You Ever Been Mellow?, the title track from that album was a huge hit, as was the next single, Please, Mr. Please. Her string of hits cooled off, but not for long. During this period, she did her own television show, and then Hollywood really came calling. Olivia starred in the movie version for the Broadway musical Grease. Fun fact, by the way, Carrie Fisher of Star Wars fame was up for the role of Sandy. Star Wars pretty much killed the idea. Grease not only became a huge hit, but the soundtrack became one of the biggest selling soundtracks of all time. As far as Olivia's contributions to the soundtrack, she got three top five songs out of it. You're the One That I Want and Summer Nights, both with co-star John Travolta and Hopelessly Devoted to You. As the 1980s rolled around, Olivia began to tire of her good girl image and decided to make it sexier and more mature. She starred in the movie Xanadu, which didn't do too well, but the soundtrack did really well, giving her the hits Xanadu, Magic, and Suddenly. She started off the decade with the mega-successful and extremely controversial song and music video, Physical. The song was controversial because of the subject matter and heavy innuendo, which was okay for male rock artists, but not for female pop artists, I guess. The music video was also controversial because it had two men in it who were holding hands and looking at each other. Both the song and music video were banned in certain places. In spite of the bands, or maybe even because of them, the song became the biggest selling song of the 1980s. 
fun fact here as well. The guitar solo on Physical was performed by Steve Lukather of the group Toto, who was on a ton of songs from the 1970s and 80s that you may not realize, along with having hits with his own band, Toto, of course. He was also on the Michael Jackson big-selling album Thriller. Another attempt to change her image was during the release of her album Soul Kiss. On the back cover for that album, she put a photo of herself taken from behind, with herself topless, wearing tight equestrian horse-riding pants and holding a riding crop. For the 1980s, and especially for Olivia's fans, that was pretty spicy. Her singing career cooled off again in the mid-1980s as other endeavors took over. She became an entrepreneur with her friend Pat Carroll, became a UNICEF spokesperson, a wildlife advocate, and a cancer spokesperson having fought a battle with breast cancer. She acted occasionally, including on the TV show Glee, along with being a guest judge on RuPaul's Drag Race. She also had a number one hit on the Billboard dance charts in 2015 with a dance version of the song Magic, this time as a duet with her daughter Chloe. This new version hit the top of the dance chart, giving Olivia a rarity of having a mother-daughter chart-topping song. Olivia lost her second battle with cancer on August 8, 2022, after having it come back in 2017 when the breast cancer that she originally had 25 years earlier spread to her lower back. There have been many articles written about her that stated that the movie Grease made her a star. That's not true. Not even close. She was already a star with a bunch of hit songs and awards by then. Grease made her a superstar, and then Physical took her to an even higher level. You can tell that the people who wrote those articles weren't over the age of 40. Otherwise, they would have known. Olivia had two number one albums, five number one singles, countless other hits that didn't even make it to number one, and four Grammy Award wins and also Country Music Awards. She sold over 100 million records worldwide, making her one of the biggest selling artists of all time. The death of entertainer Olivia Newton-John from cancer on August 8, 2022. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. On to the birthdays, which aren't for people, really. They're actually more for things, we'll say. First, we're going to celebrate the awarding of United States patent number 2089.171 for what was called the Rickenbacker frying pan. The frying pan was invented by G.D. Beauchamp and Adolf Rickenbacker, who ran the Electro String Instrument Corporation. This patent took them almost five years to get. Part of the reason was that it had to be revised and edited a bunch of times so that they could prove that parts of their invention did not infringe on other inventions. One part of their invention was to have a magnetic field be placed near a string. When the string vibrated, the field would pick up on the vibration and amplify it in some way or form. And that came a little too close to sounding like the invention of the telephone, so they had to repeatedly show that it was not a different version of a telephone. What they were really trying to do was to invent an instrument that would solve a problem. Way back when, the acoustic guitar had a problem. While it was good for quiet performances, it wasn't good when you put it with louder instruments, like, say, a trumpet. The frying pan was going to change all of that, and it was also going to make them very, very rich. 
After five years of wrangling with the United States government and after putting in revision after revision after revision after revision, on August 10th, 1937, the Patent Office finally awarded them their patent. As luck would have it, though, other people would also come close to their ideas, making it cheaper and becoming rich off of their idea. Think of the whole Apple iPhone, Samsung Galaxy phone legal argument. You kind of get the idea. The Rickenbacker frying pan would eventually become very influential, especially in rock and roll, where it would also get a name change to the electric guitar, whose original patent was issued on August 10th, 1937. Now, for the birthday of an album. When rap first burst onto the scene, it was considered dangerous, although it really wasn't. 1979 song Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang was about as non-dangerous as you could get. The 1980s saw battle rapping, which still wasn't dangerous. It was just two rappers going after each other on record, long before people got stupid and started shooting each other. You had Run DMC, the Beastie Boys, and LL Cool J breakthrough, but again, they weren't considered dangerous, quote-unquote. After all, Run DMC needed you to walk this way, the Beasties fought for your right to party, and LL, of course, needed love. What made rap dangerous in politicians' and the media's eyes was the fact that at that time it was still considered poor black people's music, to be blunt about it. Public enemies started to get political and scare mainstream America, especially after Professor Griff's rant about Jewish people got out, but they were rare in that realm due to mainstream America following, quote, safer, unquote, artists like DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. That all changed on August 8th, 1988, when the rap group N.W.A. came out with the album Straight Outta Compton, which had three hit songs on it, Straight Outta Compton, Express Yourself, and F the Police, which I'm not going to say what the F stands for. You already know. N.W.A. consisted during their two-album career of Easy e Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, MC Ren, DJ Yella, Arabian Prince, the DOC, and DJ Speed. They were not clean cut like Will Smith or political like Public Enemy. They were in your face talking about their lives as they lived it and saw it. Their talk about police brutality scared mainstream America, especially the song F the Police. The song wasn't so much about the fact that they were getting brutalized by the cops, because they were. It was more about the fact that they were going to fight back. Dr. Dre, by the way, was not a fan of his own album. As Dre said in an interview in 1993, quote, To this day, I can't stand that album. I threw that thing together in six weeks so we could have something to sell out of the trunk. Back then, I thought the choruses were supposed to just be me scratching, end quote. Who else wasn't a fan of N.W.A. or the song F. The Police, aside from, obviously, the police? Conservative politicians, who, of course, used it as a culture war and racial issue. The song came out during the presidential election between George H.W. Bush and Michael Dukakis. At that time, the Bush campaign was already playing racial politics, thanks in no small part to Bush campaign strategist Lee Atwater, by putting out the now infamous Willie Horton ad campaign about a black violent ex-con who was released under a weekend furlough program that existed under the governorship of Dukakis, who was then governor of Massachusetts. One weekend, Horton didn't return from his weekend furlough, Instead, he went to Maryland, where he raped a white woman twice, but only after he pistol-whipped her fiancé. The ad was made to look not like it was a single incident where race was not the overriding factor. It was actually made to look like black men were going to rape, rob, and murder white people, and Dukakis would be responsible for it. 
Lee Atwater confessed to playing up the racial overtones in his autobiography before he himself passed away from cancer in 1991. Now that you have the powder keg that was that election, throw in the dynamite that was NWA's F the Police. Once that song came out, the Bush campaign pounced on it. Then vice presidential candidate Dan Quayle led the attack, repeatedly playing it up for all its racial glory while showing how much he and George H.W. Bush were both pro-police and would be tough on crime. They even tried to get both the song and the album banned, but to no avail. For the record, Republicans also tried to turn the 1988 Sean Penn-Robert Duvall LAPD cop film Colors into a culture war issue for its portrayal of the Los Angeles gang scene at that time. Ironically, rapper Ice-T would find himself in the middle of political culture wars a few times. The first two times being his own albums getting parental advisory stickers put on them so that major retailers wouldn't sell them, and again because he sang the theme song to the movie Colors. For its part, the Bush campaign would try to play the same racial cards in 1992 during their re-election bid, this time with rapper Ice-T's heavy metal side project band Body Count, when the band's debut self-titled album and their song Cop Killer came out. Less than a decade later, Ice-T would start a 25 years and counting run playing a cop on the hit TV show Law & Order SVU. Weird how the world works sometimes. In 1992's presidential campaign, the racial music politics didn't work, although his challenger, Arkansas Governor William Jefferson Clinton, would play racial music politics as well with a comment that was made by Sister Soldier of Public Enemy. We discussed that in a podcast a few months ago. The problem for Bush this time was that even though he was riding high off the country's patriotic fever after the first Gulf War, he was also working against a bad economy. And while Clinton did play racial politics with musicians, it was a battle this time around between an older greatest generation incumbent president versus a younger yuppie slash baby boomer politician who was at least a charismatic politician at that time. Trust me, Michael Dukakis was not charismatic. Check out his answer in a 1988 debate when moderator Bernard Kalb asked him if he would support the death penalty in his home state if his own wife was raped and murdered to see just how uncharismatic Dukakis really was. While the question was offensive and meant for shock value, it was also meant to give Dukakis an opportunity to give an empathetic response, which he failed at miserably. Just in case some of you thought that Donald Trump and other politicians playing racial politics these days is something new, especially this whole thing about how people cannot be biracial and celebrate both parts, yeah, well, it's not new. This has been going on for generations. It just usually doesn't involve music, but it did in NWA's case. How would all of this play out for NWA? Well, Along with national politicians, the police themselves tried to intimidate them. On August 6, 1988, at a show in Detroit, Michigan, the police stopped the group's performance before they could perform F the Police. They took NWA off stage and escorted them back to their hotel without even filing charges. The reason why the cops broke their civil rights? Because, as the cops said, they didn't want the kids to disrespect the police by singing the song. Go figure. Well, all of the controversy made them more popular with black people who felt that they were being personally attacked through N.W.A. It also made them more popular with white kids because, of course, whatever parents hate, kids love. Those who saw the movie Straight Outta Compton pretty much know what happened next. The band went on to great success, followed by a serious breakup. Dr. Dre and Ice Cube would go on to have extremely successful solo careers. Dre put out the landmark album The Chronic and would produce chart-topping albums for Eminem, Snoop Dogg, and 50 Cent while becoming an almost billionaire at this time. While Ice Cube would have success with songs like It Was a Good Day, along with a successful acting career, including, ironically, 
co-starring in the movie Boys in the Hood and playing a cop in the 21 Jump Street movies. Again, strange how the world works. Unfortunately, Easy e would have a couple of solo hits before passing away from complications of AIDS. The band itself would reunite for one night while accepting their induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the subgenre of rap that they introduced, gangster rap, would morph into the dominant form of hip-hop for the next 20 years and counting. And it all started when N.W.A.'s landmark album, Straight Outta Compton, was released on August 8th, 1988. Next, we celebrate the birthday and coming out party for the merry-go-round, which catapulted as genre into one of the biggest forms of music worldwide. And it all started in the Bronx. On August 11th, 1973, there was a party held in the basement of 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in Bronx, New York, about a mile away from Yankee Stadium, give or take. It was to celebrate a girl's birthday. Like most kids who have parties, the first thing you do is you get your friends and family to help throw it, and this girl was no different. It just so happened that this girl got her brother to DJ the party. The brother, Clive Campbell, a.k.a. DJ Cool Herc, was born on April 16, 1955 in Kingston, Jamaica. He spent his first years growing up in Jamaica, but his family moved to the Bronx, New York when he got older. As he went out to parties and was learning how to become a DJ, he noticed something about the way the DJs spun their records. They would do a call and response and talk over the records at certain points. He also noticed that people would come out to dance mainly during the parts of the songs where the drums kicked in, otherwise known as the drum break, in order to try out new moves. So he had an idea. What if he took the drum part of the song and made it longer? He worked on the idea with two turntables and a microphone, as the Beck song says, He put the same record on both turntables so that while one was playing, he could use the other one to go back to the point of the song that he needed to get to, sometimes scratching the record in order to do it. He called this trick the merry-go-round. Finally, on August 11th, 1973, at the age of 18, Herc brought his invention out into the public in front of his biggest crowd at that time, his sister's birthday party. He threw up two copies of a James Brown record onto the turntables. The crowd figured that he would just do a regular transition between the records. Instead, he did his merry-go-round trick. These days, it's known as the breakbeat. The crowd went wild. Soon, word spread of the new style and people started copying it. Some started rapping over it. And soon, the organic style of music first known as rap and now known as hip-hop took its first major steps. And it all started in the Bronx on August 11th, 1973, when the kid's brother DJ Cool Herc took two turntables and a microphone and helped to invent not only a new style of music, but also helped to change world music along with youth and street culture and make history while doing it. It has been banned. It has been ridiculed. It has been the subject of many, many racial attacks. It has incurred many a conservative's wrath. It has been legislated against, and some of its creators like Public Enemy, Two Live Crew, and N.W.A., who we just spoke about, have been declared enemies of the state and worse. Yet, through it all, and despite it all, the attempted cancellations and the cries of quote-unquote wokeness because of various culture wars over the decades, it has not only survived, but it has thrived, much like the culture and the people who it came from. Happy birthday, hip-hop, and thank you, DJ Cool Herc. We couldn't have done it without you, quite literally. The birth of rap music and hip-hop culture at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx, New York, 
on August 11th, 1973, when Clive Campbell, a.k.a. DJ Cool Herc, took two turntables and a microphone and helped to invent history. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for August 7th through the 13th. Thanks for listening and watching.